Hey, pst, wanna hear about chili harvest in December, flimsy aquaponics, spiky glowworm larvae, summer in winter, and snail breeding? Then, by any means, stay tuned. Welcome to Peppers and Glowworms, a channel dedicated to hot chili peppers and coldly glowing glowworms. <coughs> <coughs> This is Weirdlog number 43. I'm gonna show you how my glowworms and some of the chili pepper plants are doing during winter. Let's start with the chili specimens that I'm grooming for my breeding program. These here have kinda stopped growing, but they are well. That individual uh, was the last one to be pruned, so it looks a bit different, but all in all they they are fine. And it is the Cariolokia creeper strain. Zero. The F2 generation. The latest addition to my breeding program is the Ahi Charipa. A cross between the Ahi Charapita and Carolina Reaper chocolate. One interesting side note about the parents. Um, I did put out the Carolina Reaper chocolate in uh, late autumn. And it immediately started to flower and produce some small fruits. And even now in December they are still on the plant and look kind of okay. So um, let's have a closer look. Yeah, you can kinda guess that it's a reaper from the form of the fruits. And I would wish that they stayed this small because my breeding goal is a small fruited super hot. Yeah, and the plant is even still alive it seems. Uh, not so much the Ahi Charapita. Anyway, they will continue in their offspring and this is the F1 generation by the way. I did put uh, two individuals in a kind of aquaponic setup together with my Japanese rice fish that uh, spent the winter inside. The setup basically consists of three stacked yogurt containers each and some leftover aquarium sand. You can see uh, this individual adapted to this new kind of setup and uh, grew uh, quite okay. The other one um, not so much, but it also adapted and grew a bit. The best growth was achieved by the multiple individuals that were put into a regular normal pot, a bigger one. The bottled individual um, grew okay as well. And um, the one that stayed in the original container only grew slightly better than the aquaponic individuals. Oh, and by the way, that bottle was a souvenir from Sardinia in 2004. And you know what else I brought from there? That's right, the founder individuals of my glowworm colony. And this is my whole current colony. Well, not uh, totally true, there's also this, but uh, more about that at the end of the video. Quite a few individuals have already pupated, so there are not that many larvae left from generation 21, but let's have a look at them. I have updated my setup, I'm now using some leaf litter, some moist sponge cloth and cocoa fiber as a substrate. I recently counted, so those should be 110 larvae. As I mentioned, quite a few had already pupated and I have also given away 68 larvae for a scientific project. And um, to be honest, there was also a slight spike in mortality in the last few weeks. Um, maybe related to feeding, I don't really know. Um, but those are the larvae that I still have left and they look quite nice and healthy. And there is one particular individual that I want to show you. It is uh, this one. You can see the edges of the thorax are kind of pointy and spiky compared to the other larvae. That's interesting. It uh, kind of reminds me of a trilobite beetle. I shall name you Spike. While my chili pepper plants are basically dormant right now, the glowworm colony is quite active. How can this be? Well, simply because I keep them in an artificial summer, so to speak. They have normal room temperature and they are kept closely to an aquarium. And they of course receive the light from that aquarium and they have a day that starts at about 6 am and ends at about 10 pm. So they have basically summer conditions and they act like it. Let's move on to the reproductive individuals. We have here some male pupae, one, two, and three. And there are also some adult males trying to find a female already. 
This was uh, recorded shortly before Lights Out, by the way. Well, um, I think I will pick up those pupae and put them in the same package as the other larvae that are sent off for this project. Oh, and you could see um, the disturbance-induced glowing behavior in this pupae. Always easy to see. There. It's not a very strong glow, but it is uh, quite noticeable. You see? Basically a warning. And this pupa, oh, also nice glow. You can see the, the two light emitting organs. I will keep this pupa because it's already older. The eyes are slightly pigmented already. Here we have one female pupa. It's also already a bit older because the eyes have started to become pigmented. And this pupa will also join the others for this certain project. And again, it disturbance induced glow. This is where I put the adult females and I wait for them to show their glowing behavior. Not the disturbance induced glow, boop boop, but the glow meant to attract a mate. Of course, keeping glowworms on eternal summer setting has the downside that I have to provide them with food even during winter. And therefore I acquired some feeder snails. And among those, also an individual of Azulenus pixi. I want to try them out. And I'm also starting a new giant African land snail breeder population. This is Achatina fulica, white jade. Very mesmerizing to watch them eat, like a lava lamp almost. And finally, I am very happy to announce that so far every female has successfully produced a clutch of eggs. Nice, nice, nice. So it looks like I'm gonna need every extra snail. Because I suspect those little larvae to be to put quite the dent in the population of bladder and ramshorn snails in my rice fish tanks. Yeah, generation 22 of my colony of is going to happen. Objective. The voice out of the earth.